since today's topic is all about collecting quality evidence, just as a reminder, you're only required to collect evidence for mathematical thinking and language and literacy. But meanwhile, we are teaching, observing, and making checklist ratings in all of those domains. So you are going to hear us talk about possibly linking those really high quality pieces of evidence to other domains, just so you have some information to share with families, and it's so quick. You will need to collect evidence in other domains if you feel like a child is really struggling and might need some extra support. So go ahead and gather some evidence to help document that process. This afternoon, this is how we're kind of designed this webinar. We are uh, pulling lots of examples that we've seen in work sampling. Many of you are new. And what we've heard from teachers over the years is they really appreciate seeing some non-examples as well as good examples. So show us some things that aren't quite as good or could be better and how we can kind of ramp it up and go that extra step. Why do we want to do that? One, it's going to link to many more indicators. It's also going to really deepen that learning for the child, as well as let us really understand where that child is developing on that particular skill. So uh, that's how we're going to get started. I want to just say as a reminder that assessment is really based on a child's individual knowledge. When we review evidence and work sampling, what we see a lot of is what I kind of call generic statements. So if we really think about what a child is able to do, if we're really trying to assess a child, it has to be what that particular child says or that we see through their actions. So a lot of times we'll see notes or matrices written with kind of those generic things. There's nothing wrong with the activity going on but it will say children responded with rhyming words as they transitioned to center time. So that's a great transition activity, right? And you can give the child a rhyming word, but then what you want to do is put it on that individual basis of creating a matrix perhaps. And you're asking Jennifer, Jennifer, tell me a word that rhymes with cat, right? And then you hear Jennifer say, that. And, and then you can quickly check off on the matrix. Yes, that rhymes with cat. Go choose your center, right? Or something like that. Another one we see a lot. Children identified letters of the alphabet. Again, you'd really want to know, is it all 26 letters? Are they lowercase or the uppercase? Is it the letters in their name? So those kind of gen generic comments don't work quite as well. But really, because what we have to always remember is that we're assessing so we can determine what we need to teach. And generally, when we come back to notes or comments that are written like that weeks later, looking at that individual child, we're not sure what letters they actually identify. So that's kind of the um, preface um, as we get started. So we're going to start out today. We're going to go through different types of evidence to collect. And Jennifer is going to start out and talk to you about matrices. Thanks, Sherry. So we wanted to start with matrices for a couple of reasons. A matrix is a quick and easy way to gather assessment information for children. You use it for very predictable, easily observable behavior. And one thing to remember about matrices that works a little bit differently than the other types of evidence we talk about is that those can be designed in advance. So as you are thinking about your lesson plans and you know next week you are going to start introducing some patterning activities to your children, you can go ahead and design that matrix and know that on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you or that assistant teacher is going to have that matrix ready to go. The other thing we look for when we think about matrices is that we're looking at very concrete skills. Either the child has it, they've got it or they need help. And that really is the most simple way to explain it. So again, it's quick and easy. In fact, a lot of times when you think about using a matrix, you don't even have to have that conversation with the child because you're just looking and saying, yes, they counted using one-to-one -one through five, or they needed help. And it's that quick and easy. So 
I think matrices are probably the one type of evidence that we see the most confusion and probably could give you the most advice about entering a matrix into WSO. And we see some kind of crazy stuff when we think about matrices. For example, when you're entering evidence, remember in Noodly teacher training, we talked about that title. When you're getting ready to enter evidence, it is just an M for matrix. That's all you have to type. If you are going in there and saying, M, matrix for following the morning routine, or M, matrix, this was a line cutting activity. That is taking time. And what we don't think about is you're like, it's just a few words to type, but think about doing that over and over and over again. So make it easy on yourself, just say M for matrix. That's all you have to do. The other thing I want you to think about is when you're linking a matrix. So typically when we talk about matrices, we talk about it will link to one, sometimes maybe two indicators. But I want you to look at this matrix example. The teacher wrote in the description that the children classified animals by horns, tail length, type of fur, whether they were domestic or wild, forest or farm animals. But look at those links. We linked it to uses expanded vocabulary or communicates experiences. It's really important when you are looking at these indicators to pay attention to the verb. Uses expanded vocabulary and language tells me as a teacher, I really want to hear what that child said or communicates experiences means I probably should be writing down something that child said and a matrix is not the vehicle to use to collect that information. You might be able to use that matrix and link it to beginning to recognize patterns and making simple generalizations because we know that classifying and sorting when we read that rationale is really um, part of mathematical thinking A4, and we could link it to that. But if we really wanted to get at what do those children know and understand about the animals we were sorting, if I'm, again, not doing that as a matrix, but change that to a note. And notice I have selected Jalid, Christian, and Grayson. And my note is I start out with that sorting and classifying a variety of animals. But then I go on and capture what they said. So the deer and the rhinoceros both have a horn, but the rhinoceros only has one, so he has to be by himself. Deer can live on the farm, but I don't think a rhinoceros can. And it goes on, the teacher's asking questions. It's that back and forth conversation. And when we capture that, we can link it to many more indicators and it gives you that really rich piece of evidence. Whereas with a matrix, you know, none of these are really those kind of easily observable concrete skills we're looking at. So we've got to capture that conversation to really get at what does that child know and understand when it comes to thinking about these groupings of animals and classifying a variety of animals. Here's something we see a lot too. Don't make a matrix out of a language experience chart. Language experience charts have their place in your classrooms. They're fun to do. It's a great way to involve children and really get them talking about something, but take a look at this example. So this was all about using sensory jars and the children were asked which sound was their favorite. So the teacher had a matrix, listed all the children's initials and what they responded with was their favorite sound. What I really want you to think about is what you're assessing with this because favorite really doesn't get you anything. That's kind of subjective. And remember, we're looking for those easily observable, predictable, concrete skills. So even if the child said, I like the sound of coins, you have to stop and ask yourself, what can I assess knowing that? Again, while these are fun to do in our classrooms and we put them up and we, we review those with children, it's really not worth your time uploading those language experience charts to WSO because you're really not getting at any particular skill with those. Another thing we see a lot 
is we see using ratings in the title. You don't need to do that. You don't need to know if that matrix was for children that were proficient or in process or not yet. Remember, we're not really uploading this as evidence. You're going to go in later and make those checklist ratings. So this really doesn't help you because you're choosing those individual children and that work is going into their portfolio. So you're not going to use those ratings in the title of your evidence. The other thing, if you look at the one in the right hand corner, where it talks about these four children could not count one to five or six to 10 or talk about more and less than. Remember, we want to focus on what the children did do. They needed help counting one to five because the description you're using for this evidence is also what you're going to be sharing with parents. And you would have to think about rephrasing that and how would you say that to a parent so it's worded more positively. So just start from that positive perspective. And again, just getting back into those titles and not putting those ratings. So you should never use the ratings, not in the title or the description of the evidence. So here's an example of this. All, every one of these, the teacher used the ratings as part of that description. So there's several reasons you don't do this. Again, you're not making this assumption on one piece of evidence most times. Your checklist ratings are done, are completed, and you really reflect on a pattern of behavior that you've observed instead of just one example in isolation. Think about something you tried for the first time. I tried to learn how to knit and I could not cast on that very first time. Now I've learned how to cast on. I learned how to do the knitting stitch, but I'm left-handed and it took me forever to learn how to purl. If you're a knitter, you know what I'm talking about. We always want to give children ample opportunities to demonstrate a particular skill. So as you are thinking about, again, talking to families and communicating with them throughout the year and during those parent conferences, we don't share those ratings with families. We talk about what the child can do and what we're continuing to work on, those areas we're gonna to continue to support. So leave that rating language out of the title and the description when you're entering evidence. The other thing we see a lot is teachers will take a photograph of the matrix and add it as an atta attachment. Don't do that. It's just a time thing. You're taking the data from that matrix and entering that data. There's no sense in uploading a picture of that matrix as well. It's just extra work for you. How do you enter a matrix? Look at each of those columns on the matrix and think about the children that we'll go back to counting, could count one to five playing the on-off game. We enter all the children that could, link that to those indicators, save it, and then go and enter a second matrix for the children that needed help. And that's all there is to it. It is quick, it is easy, it should take you just a couple of minutes when you're doing a matrix the right way. All right, Jennifer, do we want to pause a minute and see if there's any questions about matrices? Shana. Yes, um, I just want to reiterate. So the matrices is only to be used if you are trying to um, use maybe to link it to one or two indicators at the most, correct? Typically, yes. There, okay. you know, again, you're looking at the skill you're assessing and mm -hmm. you just have to ask yourself, is it something I can assess by really, yes, they've got it or no, they needed help. Okay. Okay. And can you also do small group matrices where you don't have to do a whole group? Absolutely. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm using it for um, small group time absolutely. where I'm going from person group to group. Yes, you can absolutely do that. Um, what you, and as you're planning, and that's why we make the point of a matrices is planned in advance, because as you're thinking about grouping your children, 
you may know that you're going to play a math game and you know that three of those seven children are really kind of at that um, level of counting where you really want to know, can they count one to five? But you might have four other children in that small group. So let's say you're, you're looking at kind of that heterogeneous group. You might have those other four children and you want to know, can those four children count one through 10? You can do that all in the same matrix and just enter it separate for those groups of children. Okay, gotcha. That sounds good to me. That's a huge Thank you. favor. Absolutely. It, it is. It's most certainly. And I have one one other question. I'm not sure if it's, it's, it's related to this or not, but as we get, say we get new children to come in, I have two new students. Um, am I picking up right where they are at that point? I'm not trying to go back and get them to where the other children are. Am I, am I, do you understand what I'm saying? Like if I have, haven't maybe tested them from one to five and they're new, do I need to go back or do, am I just picking up where everybody is in the classroom at that time? Yeah, you'll need to observe that particular child just to kind mm -hmm. of start to develop a, a baseline for that child as well. Now, okay. depending on at what point in this first period they enter your classroom, mm -hmm. I mean, right now they should be able to demonstrate a lot of different things to you. And you've got plenty of time between now and the end of period one to assess that child. So just okay. I have two that come in, I think yeah. about two weeks. They've been here about two weeks. Yeah, you'll need to just maybe during center time or put them in a small group where you can do some observations, but start mm -hmm. gathering that information from them as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Brandy. I, I've seen a teacher do it where they put the matrix in and then in the description, they say, you know, what the assessment was. And then they've put the initials of the students who did it well, and then initials of students who needed help. And then where they separated it was when they did their checklist. Do you guys recommend that or no? No, no because what you're doing when you go in to enter the matrix and you're checking the children's names, you're selecting those children on the left-hand side, you're selecting the children that could, and that automatically groups them together as part of that observation. So you don't have to take the time to then retype all their names in that description because you've already selected them. So enter it for all the children that could, save it, then go back and enter it for all the children that needed help. Because when you get ready to make checklist ratings and you want to review that evidence, that makes it so much quicker that you're not having to read through 22 names on the description to find, could Brandy do it or did she need help? Okay, now let me go to Jennifer. Could Jennifer do it or did she need help? So it just, it's a huge time saver. And that's what we're all about is trying to save you some time. So enter it as two different entries. It goes super fast and it's much easier when you get ready to review that evidence. Okay, April? Yes, my question um, is the last webinar, you guys, in, in the in the title box, there was like a P and a, I think an A for audio and a P for picture um, for the evidence. Mm -hmm. So if we're doing the matrices, like say for instance, for me, like I've taken pictures of my students doing their like tracing. Right. And as I'm uploading like information, I have a picture evidence of it. So okay. I've been doing where I've been loading individual right. information for students. So April, all we've talked about so far are matrices. We're getting ready to talk about all the other types of evidence. So okay. a matrix, but you just put a single letter of whatever yeah. it is. You'll put P for photo, A for audio, WS for work sample, or N for note. So that's not a part of the, the matrices, right? No, matrices okay. is a different type of evidence. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay let's move on and talk about notes. So remember... Notes are rich, they're detailed, you're gathering children's conversation, you're, you're really detailing that their words and their actions as you're doing these observations. And remember, we're going to keep these positive. We're going to focus on what the child did and what they said. And when we capture that, we can link to multiple indicators. So a couple of time savers, let's look at this one. Notice we have a note. We have it in for um, six children. I have them checked in my selection box. 
I don't have to retype their names in that description because it's going to filter it into their evidence file in WSO. Another time saver, so that's one time saver. Don't go back and type Nicholas, Teo, Christian, Corinne, Diara, and, and Lane were building a tower in the block center. Just start built tower in block center and then use their initials to really um, break out what each child said. That again, it doesn't sound huge, but over time that saves you a lot of time when you're not retyping children's names and, and that kind of thing. Another thing we see is teachers typing the language from the indicators into the description. Don't do that. That's a lot of extra typing and you don't need to do that because you're going to link it to those indicators. So notice this one, it says, we have been discussing seasons and reading books. The children were able to relay key ideas and details from text while following the rules of the classroom. They spoke clearly and we understood what they were saying. They were discussing pumpkins rotting and used expanded vocabulary. You just described three of the indicators you're linking that to. Don't retype all of that because when you click link to performance indicators, it's going to capture that. Here's a good example. So remember in newly teacher training, Jane talked about record the conversation as if you were a camera. I love this one. This was a note. It's um, the little boy's name started with D. He said, I built a racetrack. The teacher says, what would you like for me to know about your racetrack? I made it with blocks. What are the shapes of the blocks? Squares. Why are there cars on the racetrack? You know, cars race on the track. Some go fast like this and some go slow. I like my car to go really fast. My dad drives fast like this. It is so much fun. Then the teacher says, how many cars do you have on your racetrack? One, two, three, four, five. So capturing that conversation, including what the child said and what the teacher said, gives you the ability to link that to multiple indicators. And that's really what you're going for is what we call high quality evidence. One of my biggest problems is the assistant teacher, I've been trying to show her how to do the notes. So when she has a small group and I go to get whatever they did, she got, John said, no, this one said, yes, this one said, no, this one said, yes. And I'm like, huh, okay, I didn't get anything here. And so it's like, okay, maybe, maybe in a couple of weeks, I'll do this again and I'll do it. And it's just wasting time. You got any suggestions? Um, is there any way the teacher can use audio from an iPad or a phone? Never thought of that. Great idea. All right, we're going to move on to talk about attachments. When we talk about attachments, you enter them all kind of the same way. So we're talking about them kind of all together. So photos, whether it's a photo, a work sample, audio, or a video clip. Be intentional. We know we can't get everything our children do in the classroom. So our children do lots of things in our pre-K classroom that we are not uploading in WSO. Make sure you get what you want. Choose those work samples. Work samples give you so much information. So they really can showcase what an individual child can do. You want to include that description. Again, if you can include conversation, that is really going to up your number of indicators that you can link it to. And in general, you use them when it's too difficult to describe in a note. Let's look at some examples. Again, we're talking a lot about just saving time because we know that's so important. This is a photo. Again, nothing wrong. This is a, a visitor that came, spoke to the children in large group. The teacher uploaded it and linked it to LLA1, Gains the Meaning by Listening, and then participates in the group life of the class. Photos really do take extra work. So if you're going to take the time to upload them, make sure you get a lot of bang for your buck. There's two things with that. There's no evidence required for PSD. So we don't really need to link to that. We're not 
gathering evidence to get for that because there's so many things that we can link participates in the group of the life group life of the class to. Gains meaning my listening is one of those kind of low level indicators. You know, in those first weeks of school, which children can really listen. So don't enter a photo that is just going to be linked to that one indicator. So here's another one is a photo where the children were clapping the syllables to their name as a transition. Nothing wrong with doing that. Nothing wrong with doing that, but you don't need that photo. You can use that and link it to demonstrate phonological awareness super easy without having to add that photo. Again, that's something even that you could collect, like I said, as part of that transition. All right, so on the other hand, this is a great example. We get a lot of really good photos in the block area and dramatic play. Um, so you see this child has built this set of blocks. <clears throat> He's trying to um, have a roll down and crash those blocks. So really rich, again, look at that description. That's what's gonna really ramp up those number of links. So a couple of tips on attachments. We know you can't be everywhere in the classroom, but if you take these rich photos or you collect these work samples, you can show them to children even days later and say, tell me about this block structure you were building and what you were able to do. And they'll tell you lots of stories about it. So if you can't get it right there in the moment, but if you can, that's obviously the best. Here's an example, just for trying to show you some different things. This was a work sample that was uploaded. The children created these houses and glued and cut and did all this. Again, really cute activity, great activity to do, but again, to upload it for physical development is not really necessary because evidence is not required in that. So what could you do a little bit differently if you're gonna have children create houses like that or make drawings, just get a little more bang for your buck take it a little bit deeper. So have them draw or create those houses, write a story about them, take some dictation with it, and then you're able to link to lots of those language and literacy indicators. And then it becomes a really rich, high quality piece of evidence. Also note here that we link to some social studies indicators. Again, those are not required, but it does give you some really great information to go ahead and link to um, so you have some of that in your family conferences to really be able to talk about what that child is able to do in that area. Looking at this one, we are looking at shows awareness of things in the environment. So the description on this note was when asked about her weekend, S said, we went to the splash pad at the water park. It is close to my house in Statesboro. It's pretty good, but then what can you do better and really ramp it up? If you really want to take that up a notch, collect that work sample, kind of explore those mapping skills, really talk to children about what's in their community, what do you see on your way to school, you'll see what a rich example this is that you can add um, where the child added all these things about going to school. And it just shows, I mean, again, what we're trying to really get at is what that child understands about mapping and being where things are located in the environment. So the richer work sample that you can get, since you're already uploading, just keep talking to the children about it. Get that really rich description that goes along with it. This is another example of a work sample that was uploaded. They observed the weather outside and the child said, that's me in the raindrops. I have an umbrella and that's a dog. And it was linked to many, many, many indicators you can see there. So what we want you to really think about is make sure you have that really good understanding of those rationales. For instance, we pulled up the rationale for makes meaning from explorations and generates ideas and solutions based on their own observations of the natural and human made worlds. So that's a pretty deep indicator to get some evidence on. So you just want to maybe ramp it up a little bit more, have that rich conversation with that child if you're gonna to link to those really high level indicators. All right, let's go ahead and ask if there are any questions about 
notes or attachments before we move into, we have a couple of practices that we'd like you to do. Um, just a quick question. This is just my second year. And so I was doing this to kind of refresh with hybrid and all that stuff being different. Um, is there a better way? I'm Most of my photos, even if I'm taking a picture of a center or a work sample are on my phone, but I'm doing most of my entries on my laptop. And so it's the emailing the pictures all to myself and then saving them to the doc, um, desktop and then dragging them. So um, I've found when I use the photo thing on my laptop, it's not as precise, just you know, being able to have it close enough to where the little keyhole camera is getting the best picture. So is that just what is best and still keep doing it that way? Or is there a shortcut somebody uses? The organization is so individualized. You can log into work sampling on your phone. I know that makes it tiny, you know, and, and kind of hard to see all of that. You know, we used to show where you just, you know, it's like pulling your photos from your phone and you literally just pull them all onto your desktop, you know, at week at a time or whatever. Instead of really trying to do it on that individual basis, one at a time, just do a huge download of all of your photos and then kind of organize them in a folder that way and then do it all at one time. The other thing you can do, if you want to do that more intermittently, you can enter observations that will have photos on it. So then when you do your photo dump, you're just going back in and adding that attachment to it because you can go in and edit any piece of evidence very easily just by clicking on it again. I don't know, Jennifer, do you have any other ideas? I log in on my phone, Tara. I find it to be kind of easy and then you can just select from your photo album. It's, it's quick. I don't like to do linking on my phone, but I can add that photo you know, choose the children, add the photo. And then when I have time to sit down at the desktop or my laptop or whatever, go back in and make the link. So it's a little two-step process, but it's, to me, that's a little bit quicker than waiting for those photos to transfer from your phone to your laptop and filtering through them because you can kind of do it in the moment. Okay, Caitlin, you want to unmute and ask your question? So I hopped on a little late, so I apologize if this question was already asked in the beginning. Um, but is there a certain amount of evidence per child that we should make sure we have uploaded by period one? Or, you know, is there like a minimum of how much we need to make sure is there as evidence or a maximum by any sort? Not really, Caitlin. I, I think paying attention more to your checklist ratings, making sure that you are update, you know, as you review the evidence and, you know, since we're only uploading evidence for mathematical thinking and language literacy, your other ratings are based on your own observations, even, you know, those links you're making to really good evidence, but then some of it's going to be based on your observations. So it's, to me as a teacher, it's probably easier to look at those ratings and making sure that I'm not falling behind on making those ratings based on my observations and evidence. Sherry, do you want to add anything to that? No, the only other thing I would say is different children will need different amounts of evidence. Some children are very easy. Some children are, you, they got it, that kind of thing. So we never get into quantity. So each indicator is a little bit different. Each child's a little bit different. So just, it's really that you feel comfortable making that rating and you feel comfortable talking to families about rating that you have that evidence to support that rating. All right, let's do a fun little practice. We, we have this one we wanna show you that is outside time. We are big believers in assessing throughout the day. You can capture great assessment in routines and transitions and walking down the hallway in lots of different times. So let your children know that you're capturing that assessment data. Let them know that you're watching what they're doing and you think it's so cool. This is a fun outside time activity. So you guys take a look and see what you would write if you were observing this child. That's so fun one to me. Well, it's your turn now. What number did you get? Okay. How many? What number did you get? One. 
watching that child I'll try <laughs> and I'm new so yeah. this would be great practice for me I'm Angela and so um I have uh he's able to catch which would you know I would have to find this but your uh, growth motor domain he was able to hop and then I also have number sense in location um word location so everybody, I'm sure you wrote down that he counted. He recognized those numerals, which is supertizing, which falls under the indicator of number and quantity. You're right. It was he, he caught the dice. So that physical development. Anybody notice anything else? Um, I did. This is Brittany Mixon. I'm new also. I noticed that he was able to tell the teacher like when she when she like rolled the dice herself and she, he told her what number it was. And I think it was two and she moved three spaces and he was like, no, it was two. So like tell her to go back. Um, so I did see that in there. I'm not sure if there's an indicator for that or what it would be linked to, but the fact that he was able to make that connection. Well, it would still go under counts with understanding, but it, it, to me, it's that bigger resolve that he truly understands counting. He's very confident in his counting. What I like about this example, and this is a great way to kind of discriminate what type of evidence. So if you were just one-on-one -on -one with this child, like this teacher, obviously you can write a note and you could write all of that information, right? He caught the dice. He identified one, five, and six on the die. He moved that number of spaces. Um, he identified the numerals 14 and 19. He corrected the teacher when she moved three spaces instead of two. So all of those things pertain, which is great. But you could have this number line on your playground. You could do the same thing with a matrix. You could put counting. You could put subitizing on there. You could put the actual numerals, however you wanted to assess it, and do it with multiple children over the week. And both of those would be appropriate ways to get this evidence and put that in. Uh, hey, this is Marissa Gward from Lasso. I've been in pre-K for five years, but I also noticed he was using positional words behind or in front of the teacher. Yeah. So that is definitely something else. Sure, sure. And, and of course, yes, you could absolutely add that as well, and, and when you create your matrix, I mean, you can do several matrices. You can do one for supertizing, one for counting. At the beginning of the year, a lot of times we make our matrices where they have literally the numerals one, two, three, four, five, six. So if they're rolling that one die, you can really see if they understand two, or, and then you can do one for recognizing those numerals as well. You could do a variety of positional words because if you had more children play, you could really incorporate that into the conversation then and just say, are you, where is Lisa compared to you on that, on that number line when they landed on the same space and have to share a space, they're next to them. So um, that's where designing your matrix ahead of time, thinking about all those possibilities. Um, yes, I was just wondering what your advice would be for um, English language learners, especially the ones who do not speak English at all. I mean, I have a couple that are 
painting and things like that, but they are not able to verbalize anything to me. How would you record things for those children? So we always run into that in training because when we talk about really high quality evidence, it generally relates to getting that really rich conversation with children. We know our English language learners do not have that language. So you're not, I mean, you just, you have to know that you're not going to get that kind of evidence for these children. And that's okay. You have to be okay with that. But in the meantime, they can show that receptive understanding of, you know, they are pointing. If you show me which one is the numeral five and they point to it, that's fine. They don't have to say five. They can, if they're rolling the die and hopping that number of spaces without saying one, two, three, four, five, but they're getting it correct, you count that. You can write down pointing. You can talk about gestures. You can talk about understanding. You're just kind of taking that at a whole different level. Okay, thank you. Sure. All right, we have one more video to watch. I know we're close to out of time, but this is, we like this one. It's in the writing center with two little girls. Um, so you'll see lots of language, lots of things going on. So see what you think. Cassidy, give me my pink marker, please. Hey, where's my box? Hey, That's not how I made it. Like that. No, because it's my pink marker, and this is yours. No, this is not mine. Well, I did a two. You get, no, give me one, the pink. The pink? Please. Excuse me, and I can look at this. Okay, like this, lick it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I did it. Oh, so Wait, can I see this? So what do we need to do since we only have one? The other one's missing. Yes. Okay, so who's I turning this first? I need to see how you do okay. this thing. Can you show me how you do it underneath? Okay, let me do it. it like cool? this. Yeah, can you do it with the brown No, not my paper. And your paper. It has a line. Both rocks in the boat. Here. If I do it to call out some indicators, what could you link that to? Think about maybe that actual yes, paper that you would collect as well as what they were the girls were saying. Writes letters and symbols. Yes. Is that a good one? Sure. Brittany? Yes. Um, once again, I'm still learning like the different indicators. But one thing I noticed in the video is that they were using, um, I believe it would be tier two or tier three words. So I heard the little girl say, um, or she asked Jersey, she was like, oh, you did you write an exclamation point? So yeah. Spanish vocabulary. Yes. The interaction with others. Yes. Interacts easily with other children. Definitely some personal social in there, the way they were sharing and how she tore the paper and handed her part of that paper. To Even write. follows routines in the classroom, how she went and got the marker. And the fine motor of just how she was holding the marker and she Absolutely. wasn't doing the fist hold or any of those things. I think for me, that video is such a great example of a work sample I would want to collect because children's writing forming those letter-like shapes. I want to keep that work sample so I can see how they grow in forming those letter-like shapes throughout the year. So that's a great one to collect a work sample, plus jot down what they're saying, the conversation they have with each other to get at those other indicators. I think this is a good time. I know somebody mentioned earlier when Jennifer was talking about matrices, and we hear this all the time, so I can only link to one or two. There are certain indicators such as speaks clearly enough to be understood by others and gains meaning by listening. And, and some of these that you could link to 
just about everything we do in the pre-K classroom. And at some point you just have to say, I don't need more information about that. The, you know, this is another example of that. There's lots of those kind of low level indicators that you could link lots of stuff to and personal social as well as physical development and things like that. But really focus on those critical assessment pieces that we're trying to, those really critical skills that we're trying to assess. Sherry, April has, a, has her hand raised for a question. With having a video like that, where there's clear understanding of what's being said and different things like that, would you still have to record, like do a written record of what's being said, even if you upload that video as evidence? You would not. You would just put some tag, you would put V for in the title, and then you would say writing center or something, just so when you look at that description, you know what piece of evidence is entered there, but then you would link everything to it. Any other questions? All right, we appreciate all of you being on with us this afternoon, and we can stay on for a few minutes if anybody has a question, but otherwise I know our Hour is up, so I know you have other things everybody has to do. Thank you so much for joining us.